Good afternoon and welcome to the Court Achieve It Myth Busting webinar, where today we're going to be looking at four myths that could be stopping you investing today. Uh, my name is David Butler, I'm Head of Sales here at Court Achieve It. Joining me today are my colleagues, Shabir Ghulami, who's an Investment Manager, Gemma Woodward, who's Head of Responsible Investing, and David Henry, who's also an Investment Manager from our London team. So, as I said, we're going to be looking at four myths that we really want to bust wide open. And I think the first one is the one that I hear probably nearly every day. I've been in the industry 26 years, and the one I'm always asked is, is it a good time to invest? We've got Brexit, political turmoil, and uh, it's the question I think most advisors and most clients are being asked. So, Shabir, can I just ask you, is now a good time to invest? Absolutely, and I think you're right that the question is certainly one of the most frequently asked uh, for our investment managers, and my colleagues will probably agree with me here. Yeah. Uh, and I think, then, in short, the answer is yes, and for a number of reasons. Uh, there are certainly lots of headwinds. You mentioned a few, the likes of Brexit, uh, potential uncertainty with markets, with volatility, a few terms like that. Uh, media press, I mean, Mr. Trump tweets quite frequently, and yeah. that has impacts. Um, but actually, what we do is we look at the fundamentals. Uh, there are opportunities to be had across globally diversified portfolios. Uh, we invest in a range of asset classes when we're considering things like valuations, so i.e. whether something is priced cheaply or expensive. On a longer term, things are pretty good on, on a, a long-term basis. Yeah. You mentioned the word volatility. That actually has a, sometimes a panic emotion around it. What do you mean by volatility when it comes to markets? So volatility is simply the a description of how prices are moving uh, and to what extent they are moving, a price yeah. of a share, price of a company, something like that. And uh, volatility is often associated with risk. But volatility at the moment, whilst there has been increased levels, are still quite some way away from where we have been over the longer term. In fact, we're actually more normal, normalised times than, than, than more recently. Um, and as a result, we're, we're quite confident that uh, although there is volatility, there is opportunity to be had. And what I mean by that is that if we are looking at a depressed levels in markets, we can perhaps find a more attractive time to invest into a share or a company. Or actually, if we hold a position already, then we can perhaps top up existing positions. Okay. And you mentioned another V word, valuations. What do you actually mean by valuations when it comes to companies? So valuations, we're looking at forward earnings, we're looking at how a, a company's prospects look over the next 12, 18, 24, 36 months. Um, and so what we're looking at is whether the fundamentals of the company justify the price that we are prepared to pay for it. And so from a longer term perspective, valuations are not particularly cheap, but they're not particularly expensive either. So what does that mean for us as investment managers? We are considering that for long-term investors, we generally feel that there is opportunity to be had over the longer term. Okay, so you're looking long-term, you're not looking at what happens in the next week, month, six months? I mean, we're certainly aware of what's happening and try and uh, see what's, uh, envisage what's happening in terms of earnings. Uh, yeah. Companies are reporting regularly. Uh, we keep an eye on what's happening in the global uh, financial markets in terms of the press, the media. Um, and to get a feel of what's happening in, in Parliament. I mean, uh, political uncertainty is a big factor, yeah. um, but it's something to be aware of, but it doesn't actually distort markets so much. I mean, even we're talking about Brexit at the moment. Yeah. Markets have been relatively resilient. They've priced it in, if you will. Um, so whilst we're aware of the shorter term aspects, we're not overly concerned with that. We are looking at fundamentals of investing for the longer term. Okay. You mentioned Brexit a couple of times. Yeah. Obviously, we're looking at very much from a UK point of view. Yes. How much of an issue is Brexit on the global scale? Well, I mean, a lot of uh, companies and, well, and markets are, yeah. are, almost disregard it. I mean, we, we are obsessed with it at the moment. Yeah. It's toing and froing back and forth between what's happening on either side of the, the, the commons. Um, but in terms of markets, they are, it's relatively subdued. But what does that mean to us as investors? Majority of our clients invest in sterling. Yeah. Um, so when we're building portfolios, we are concerned with what's happening in the UK, but we invest in globally diversified portfolios. So it's across geographic regions, various asset classes, so that could be fixed interest or bonds, commercial property, uh, absolute return, and we do tend to hold some cash as well. But even our UK exposure 
What we're not too concerned with are UK domestic companies, i.e. companies that are largely trading in the UK. What we're looking at are the larger companies. We sometimes refer to that as large cap. Now, what that means is that a lot of these companies are earning their revenues in overseas currencies. So it could be US dollars or euros, for example. And so what that means is that our exposure to the UK is often more towards an overseas bias. So whilst we do retain an investment within the UK, we actually then diversify that across a range of asset classes and regions. Okay, so it's that old cliche, not putting all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, it is a cliche, but it's actually true. Okay. Uh, what we try and do is diversify in even within sectors as well. We might be looking at a range of different companies within. Yeah. Uh, within Europe, we might be looking at particular countries for tic- particular exposure to certain regions. Um, and, and, and it really is a case of actually trying to reduce the overall risk profile given what, ha- what the client's particular requirements are. Okay. All sounds really positive. So is it a good time to invest? Absolutely. Uh, we, we do believe that over the longer term, the timing of the entry is, uh, it becomes less relevant. Yeah. Um, there's certainly, even if we were to potentially at a, at a high point in the markets, what we're seeing is that, again, over the longer term, things will tend to, to move in a favourable direction. Okay. There's always movements in prices, but actually over the longer term, the trends are rather favourable. And even if there is a bit of a potential dip in the market, some people talk about an impending recession, uh, often those are short term, short lived, and then followed by potential return and, and greater trend towards normalised returns. So in summary, it's, it's about time in the market, not time in the market. Absolutely. I mean, once you are potentially fully invested, uh, there's concept of compounding. So compounding is whereby your returns are enhanced over time. Yeah. So typically, if you receive dividends, dividends can be reinvested and that further enhances the overall movement towards that. So that you're looking at making everything in terms of the capital of your underlying investments and the income that you've generated as well and making it all work as hard as possible to enhancing the overall return. Fantastic. Thank you, Shabir. Um, I'd like to bring Dave in at this stage because a lot of our clients are coming not necessarily from other investments, but from mm-hmm. cash. Cash is king. Yes. Should clients be still invested in cash at this time? I think certainly across the average client's uh, entire asset base, there is a place for cash. Yeah. Cash is brilliant for a few reasons. One, it's liquid, so you can get your hands on the money relatively easily and yeah. in short term requirements if you need them. So. If you have short-term expenses that you require the cash near term, cash is brilliant. The risk that you've touched upon there, Shabir, as well, is when people think about risk, they think about volatility. Share prices falling, seeing the BBC News at 10 and economists coming on talking about how difficult the world is and how the FTSE is plummeting every day. The risk that you're insulated in from cash is volatility. It's very, very stable. It doesn't move very much, if at all, depending on the interest rate that you're being paid. But the risk that people often don't consider with regards to cash is inflation. So inflation really is a major risk to the long-term purchasing power of our clients. If you you assume that the base rate, the uh, inflation across the United Kingdom remains at 2%, which is the Bank of England's target every single year, then that would reduce over 20 years the value of your capital by a third in purchasing power. So it's easy to see just how corrosive inflation will be. You're insulated from volatility by holding cash, but you're not insulated from inflation risk. So what you're saying is you actually need to put more risk to actually get a decent level of return over and above inflation. If you want to protect the purchasing power of your capital, then yes, you have to look at Asset, cli- asset classes outside of cash in yeah. the bank. Um, now, it's not necessarily just a binary decision between holding cash and having no risk and having a very, very aggressive portfolio made of shares where you're taking lots and lots of risk and yeah. you're trading that, in, uh, hedging out that inflation risk, but you're taking on lots of vol- volatility. A lot of our job is matching something in the middle for yeah. clients where they can get a sensible return that's in excess of inflation over the long term in a way where the volatility isn't too large to allow them to sleep at night. Okay, so if we're taking what Shabir has said about not putting all your eggs in one basket, mm-hmm. how do you counter the, the claim that you should be putting more cash into your portfolios now because it is a volatile market? 
Volatility creates opportunities and when valuations are depressed, that has a beneficial effect on long-term returns. There's no doubt, emphasis yeah. on the long-term, because as Shabir has outlined, in the short term, things can get very, very choppy. It is important, the most important thing I think that for clients need to bear in mind is to have a plan and to stick to it. Yeah. Now, if it can be tempting occasionally to try and invest in the market and get back out again, particularly if the news flow yeah. isn't particularly positive around the world, and that can be tempting, but that's a very, very difficult process to get right. If you decide to sell down your investments because you think the market is going to fall, you not only need to be right, the market needs to fall for you to get back in, but you also need to be right quickly because yeah. when you're holding cash rather than an invested portfolio, you're missing out on your potential capital growth and all the income that comes from a diversified portfolio yeah. of stocks and bonds. Okay. Inflation is the, the hidden enemy of all investment portfolios. What effect does inflation have on a portfolio, like the purchasing power of it? Well, over the long term, you know, that 20 year figure yeah. is, is certainly salient, I think, because you sort of say 2%, well, it doesn't sound like an awful lot today, but over 20 years, we're talking about a third, a reduction in a third of the value of a portfolio. So your capital's worth 60, 66%, roughly, what it was 20 years before. So if you want to hedge out that risk, really the only game in town at the moment okay. with, uh, the base rate, Bank of England base rate at 0.75% and inflation around 2% is a diversified portfolio of other assets. Okay. You mentioned base rate there. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of clients that are looking for income and naturally have used perhaps current accounts, savings accounts in the past. What they should be looking at now if base rates are at 0.75? Well, I think it comes back to what the underlying client's requirements are. I mean, are always as investment managers, our starting point is always what are the client requirements. Yeah. If they want as much income as possible, then you're looking at naturally higher risk investments like equities. Yeah. However, again, it tends to be somewhere in the middle. So you're looking at a diversified portfolio, not just of equities, but of also uh, fixed income investments like bonds, both government and corporate but also other alternative asset classes, such as infrastructure investments, tangible, real assets as well. Fantastic. Anything to add, Gemma, Shabir? Well, I think, I think it's, it's key to really see that cash is, is certainly a very fundamental part of an overall asset allocation. And yeah. we, we do tend to hold some cash within a portfolio. But as, as David mentioned, that the, there are, there's an opportunity cost of that. Yeah. And whilst there, is liquid, uh, whilst there is some deemed a volatility saving, there are other downsides to that as well. And so whilst we hold some, we do actually prefer to be further invested than, than not. Brilliant. I think um, you touched on it, David, as well. You know, the B word, Brexit. Yeah. Um, a lot of clients will be fearful of investing at the moment because they hear these headlines about Brexit and there's elevated political risk, uh, perceived political risk, not just in the UK, but overseas as well. You know, if we do get a negative Brexit outcome in the eyes of the market or economically, you'd expect the Bank of England to potentially reduce interest rates yeah. and you might expect inflation to worsen. So in that environment, actually, cash isn't a fantastic place to be in. There's heightened risk there, again, from the raised inflation and you're not getting the return. Okay. You mentioned political risk. There's lots of news stories about Brexit, Trump, but also at the moment, a lot of uh, things about climate change. Um, how do people take that into consideration, Gemma, when they want to invest ethically or responsibly? I think everyone has their own approach. I mean, there's been a quite a long campaign for a while now, Divest Invest, about the fossil fuel industry. And it's interesting because I think people forgot about the invest bit and focused on the divest. Yeah. Now, for a few years, you look like a genius not investing in fossil fuels because we saw much lower oil prices. As the oil price comes back up, obviously, it's a different picture. The whole point about fossil fuels, though, is there's so many different ways that people approach it. For some, um, we have a total exclusion. For others, they're looking at the percentage revenue coming from things like tar sands and coal. For others, it's about fracking. So what we try to do is really understand where the client is coming from for their own personal perspective, or if it's an institution and you know from a charitable perspective, so that we understand what they're looking to exclude. Because when we're talking about ethical, we tend to be focusing on exclusion or perhaps bringing in some positive bias. 
When we're talking about responsible investment, that's when we're engaging with companies on behalf of our discretionary clients on these issues. So for example, the oil analyst and myself have spent quite a while, as have other investors, with a major oil company, talking about how it starts bringing in what it's doing about climate transition into executive pay. And we're delighted to see that's happened. You know, a lot more people think about this. They also think about plastic. Yeah. Blue Planet, am I allowed to mention that? Yeah, I don't know, am I advertising for the BBC now? <laughs> um, you know, but Blue Planet has made a lot of people think about plastic. So when we're talking to packaging companies, we're kind of, they will talk about the plastic life cycle. We're saying, what are you doing about it? How are you going to think about that, particularly in terms of exec executive remuneration, in terms of limiting, obviously, the ex their output on that bit? There's always stories about it. There's a story today they found plastic seven miles down on the UCB. <coughs> yeah. So it's, it's got as much press coverage as Brexit and, and Trump. Um, you mentioned responsible investing. Are you saying that we were irresponsible investors before? I knew you were going to bring that up. It's just David knows the joke that when I joined four and a bit years ago and I was director of responsible investment, I had various people come up to me saying, were we investing irresponsibly before then? Which I'm sure was not the case. But um, when we talk about responsible investment, what we're looking at is factors that are related to environmental, social and governance issues that may be risks to our investment case. So we're not using it as a red line. What we're saying is, okay, this company, what are the things we should be thinking about in order to mitigate risk? Is any company perfect? No. You're never going to find a perfect company that looks beautiful and doesn't have any problems. What we're trying to do is to understand what might be impediments to shareholder returns to actually, you know, it's obviously is, you know, what our clients benefit from. How much influence do we have then as an investor with a, a, a large, uh, perhaps multinational company? I mean, it's interesting because I, I was slightly sceptical at the beginning of, you know, how much face time we would get, you know, with boards of companies where, you know, we may have millions and millions of pounds of our clients' money invested, but as a shareholder, we're actually a small percentage. But what I would say is companies actually really do listen a lot more to shareholders. They're not perfect either. And it is a generalisation. There are some who could listen a whole lot more. But an awful lot of them really do listen. And I think as well, you know, they have a difficult job. Different shareholders approach it in different ways and look at it differently. So they're trying to accommodate a lot of different views. But I think it's interesting. We do seem to have that seat at the table, which I'm very proud about. OK. And uh, how common now is ethical investing? Ethical's been around for... 20, 30 years as a concept, maybe more. I've been doing this for 25 and it was around before me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, ethical investing has been around, I mean, for centuries. Um, it probably started with religious groups, particularly the Quakers, um, and they've been you know, very instrumental in its growth in this country anyway. But if we look at it, you know, ethical, what is it? If we went around this room, we'd all have a different idea of what we don't want to invest in. So there's no such thing as an ethical company, an ethical portfolio. What we're looking for when we talk to clients is what, is, what are their ethics? I always talk about the story when I was asked to um, meet with a client and her IFA. And I was told she's very ethical, very ethical. So we start talking about what she really honestly cares about. And it kind of got down to the fact the only thing she cared about was fur. She admitted she didn't really care about people that much. She was a bit worried about that, you know, at that stage. But she honestly, that's the only thing she wanted to exclude. But we had started from a position of this person is very ethical. So you're thinking no alcohol, no tobacco, no gambling, no arms, etc. Whereas in fact, it was just fur. So it's all about understanding what the client is really you know, looking for. OK. So we've just had a question come in. Oh, gosh. Um, which is directly for you, Gemma. Which Excellent. Is, if you disagree with something that management is trying to do with the company, can you vote against them on our behalf? Absolutely. Um, the way that we engage with companies, I always do so with a relevant analyst, and I think that's really important and quite different to other places. Mm -hmm. We're not sitting separate, this funny old responsible investment team who don't wear leather or something. Um, <laughs> you know, we are working with the analyst. So we, I always meet and engage com with, with with the analyst, yeah. who hopefully knows the company better than anyone, otherwise they don't know what they're doing there. So if we don't agree with something, we vote against. We publish a quarterly report talking about all our engagement and all our voting so that they actually understand, you know, and it's very clear what we're doing. Fantastic. When you talked about ethical, you, you mentioned ex uh, excluding. Yeah. 
If you're excluded from a portfolio, does that increase the risk and reduce the performance? It depends what you're excluding. Okay. Um, if, for example, you decide to exclude tobacco producers, alcohol, some people don't like to drink, um, gambling, um, cosmetic testing, oh, sorry, animal testing, even for cosmetics, I don't think they do the other way around. <laughs> you're excluding a lot of the consumer sector. So if we look back to 2008, because I was around 2008, the two stocks I would have bought basically were a bakery and an alcohol producer, and that's based on the consumption in my office at the time, because <laughs> consumers want to kind of, you know, they want to reward themselves. So you'll need to make sure that portfolio is balanced for different parts of the cycle. Yeah. So you have to be careful about what you're excluding. If you're a very long term investor, going back to the oil and gas point, yeah, there was a while while oil and gas wasn't doing so well, but then it picked up. If you're a long term investor looking at a 10, 15 year time frame, it will in all honesty come out of the wash. If you are excluding 95% of the market, it's a very different story. So it's all about understanding what you know, impact there is on your performance and your risk profile and of course diversification. Okay. Shabir and Dave, how many of your clients have got ethical leanings or you have to actually tailor the portfolio to their beliefs or morals? I mean, I certainly do have uh, of, of several clients that do uh, have certain requirements or constraints. Um, in, in some cases, it's, it's a negative side of things whereby you're excluding a stock. In other cases, it's actually about in increasing a position or weighting towards something. For example, it could be a solar fund or it could be exposure to renewables. Um, and, and so it is a case of balancing and understanding, firstly, what the the client is after, and as, as Gemma rightly said, yeah. it's that understanding is key to then determine what they require. I think there, um, there are two jobs we have occasionally. One is to get a really good investment return, net return for our clients. Yeah. And if we can strengthen the connection between them and their money and they're happy with where it's being deployed, then all the better. And that makes for a stronger and better relationship for us with them as investment managers. So if some clients have some, some areas, not just exclusionary, but also areas that they want to the support, then the relationship works a lot better. So what I'm hearing is it's no longer a niche area of investment, it's, it's every day. No, no, absolutely. And um, I think we would all agree, you know, our investment process is such that it gives us the resource to be able to go out and build portfolios that are fit for purpose, regardless of what the client requirement is. Fantastic. So you don't feel left out, we've actually got some more questions. Um, we've got one for you, Dave, <laughs> yes. which is how much cash is too much? Very good question. Um, the general rule of thumb would be uh, at an overall level, not necessarily within an investment portfolio, but one should always have around six to 12 months of cash set aside emergency expenditure yep. effectively set aside. So if something uh, fundamental changes in an individual's um, financial life, that they would have easy access to that very unvolatile asset. Within an investment portfolio for us, sort of separately from a, a client's overall perspective, um, at the minute there is very little return available from the asset class, yeah. as I mentioned. So occasionally we might increase or decrease the amount marginally within a portfolio to try and mitigate volatility. Mm -hmm. But by and large at the moment we see better value in other asset classes. Okay. So what's a good alternative to cash at the moment for an asset class? It depends really on what you're looking to achieve from that other investment. Are you looking for a, a volatility dampener? Yeah. Are you looking for something that's going to generate diversification? In which case, although they're expensive, government bonds still have historically moved in the opposite direction to equities and can provide that genuine diversification for you. Yeah. But if you want an additional income stream, then you're looking at maybe corporate debt or listed infrastructure assets, which I mentioned earlier. So there are opportunities available, not just equities. Fantastic. I've got one for you as well, Shabir. I'm not ready for it. Okay. <laughs> oh, yes. So how do we mitigate against negative developments such as trade wars? We've mentioned Trump several times. He's got a trade war with China. How do we mitigate against that? I'm afraid we don't have a crystal ball, but what we do is We've mentioned it several times. Uh, diversification is one aspect whereby we're not necessarily just looking at what's happening between the US and China in terms of their trade war. Yeah. We're not just looking at what's happening in terms of Brexit, but we're also looking at longer term 
again, the longer term is something that we repeat over and over again. But that's simply because as investors, we are concerned with the longer term. Yeah. Our clients are planning for the future. They're often planning for legacies. They're planning for children, grandchildren, yeah. leaving a legacy. And so even when we're managing pensions, we're talking about the accumulation stage whereby people are growing their pension, but we're also talking about what happens after that as well. So there are certainly impacts of the likes of the trade wars and Mr. Trump tweeting, yeah. but uh, we try to ignore the noise, if you will, yes. and focus more on the fundamentals, looking at valuations, looking at volatility mitigation as well, looking at a diversified portfolio, so that actually we are trying to focus again and sticking to the plan, as David mentioned, having a plan, stick to it. But we're, of course, responsive and, and aware of what's happening in the wider world and the markets. And if we need to react and respond, we, we certainly can do and will do. Um, but generally trying to focus more on the longer term. OK. You mentioned we don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> that ties in very nicely to a question we have received is, okay. what happens if a client <clears throat> invests at an all-time market high? How do you react against that? It, it certainly can happen um, in terms of in, in deploying the cash into the port, into the markets and investing into the wide range of assets. And uh, there can be downturns and yeah. there will be at points and those all forms part of a cycle of investing. But these tend to be short term. Yeah. And uh, so what we look at, they may be short and sharp, but Again, focusing on fundamentals, looking at the, uh, the, uh, the longer term trends, looking at valuations and seeing whether we do believe that a stock or a company is expensive or cheap. Yeah. Focusing on that and not losing sight of what we're trying to achieve over the longer term. And history tends to reward the patience of investors. Okay. And so over, the, over a longer period, as Gemma mentioned as well, they tend to fare the, weather the storm quite nicely. Uh, you've all mentioned short term, long term. What is short term? What is long term in investments? Well, I mean, a typical equity holding period is yeah. normally around about five years. Okay. Uh, I mean, different asset classes will have different uh, profiles in, in terms of volatility and, and risk holding. Yeah. Uh, some, some assets are more liquid than others. I mean, we, uh, fixed interest as well. Uh, you tend to, when we're trading on those, tend to be more of a short, a quicker settlement time when we're buying and selling. Uh, some others tend to be a little longer, yeah. but the holding periods for them is, is, is generally around about five years. So five years is, is short term? So it's a medium to long term. Medium to medium long term. Medium long term, yeah. Okay. I think yeah. If, you, if you look back at the, the historical performance of our portfolios and strategies, you think of the big crashes in the last, well, since 1990, you're looking at 2001, yep. the dot-com bubble uh, bursting, and 2008, which I don't think we need to remind too many people of. Um, the portfolio, te if you had a, uh, an investment horizon of four years yep. at least, and you were invested at the worst possible time, which was just before those crashes, fully decided to get invested, if you had four or five years you were you markedly improved the prospects of having a positive outcome. You were yeah. back to where you were within four years as long as you stuck with your plan. Okay. So we're quickly running out of time. What I'd like to do is just recap on your own myth busting. What's the key takeaway that you want the viewers to take away today on your own particular myths? So I'll start with you, Shabir. So it is a good time to be investing. We believe so. Uh, from a, th there are lots of opportunities to be had. We think that valuations and the pricing of the investments that we're getting into are not necessarily cheap, but they're not expensive, and we focus on the longer term. So actually, yes. Okay. Um, everyone should be a responsible investor, and some people may wish to be ethical as well. Okay. And Dave? Uh, inflation is a risk to clients' wealth, yeah. and if you want to hedge out against that risk, you need to look at other assets apart from cash at the moment. Fantastic. Well, thank you for covering those myths. Um, there, we did say four myths. There was one myth that was left, which was wealth management is elitist. Hopefully what you've heard today is actually it affects everybody, whether it's inflation, cash, ethical, investing in a diversified portfolio. We believe that uh, discretionary fund management should be available to everybody. And wealth management is just about having a plan, a long-term plan, a short-term plan, and sticking to it. So we don't think it's elitist. We actually think it's the sensible thing to do that everyone should have a financial plan, whether it's them doing it themselves or using a professional advisor to help them with it. 
So we are fundamentally behind working with yourselves and with advisors in building plans for you. So hopefully you've enjoyed today. Uh, we've tried to bust the four major myths about people's uh, investing and all the reasons why they're not investing in the moment. But if you've got any further questions, please send them through to ourselves, either to our marketing team or to your investment manager, and we'll get straight back to you with an answer. So thank you for joining us.